Hi, and welcome back to Level Up Reading. This is session two, how to understand without reading. And I think at this point it might be a good idea for me to go back through and give you a clear overview of all of the remaining sessions in this course. And the first session, of course, was reading myths, mindsets, and tips, which you should have already taken. But there are three other sessions in this course, and the one you're currently uh, listening to is how to understand without reading. The final three sessions correspond with the three reading phases that you learned in the first session. So this session will be phase one, how to understand without reading, where I will teach you strategies to understand what a text is about without linearly reading it, that is, reading all the words in order. So we're going to learn how to extract a whole bunch of information from a text without actually going through and reading the whole thing. Then in session three, we'll go over reading phase two, and that's the actual reading part, how to read like a professional fast and consistently. In that session, I will teach you some techniques to increase your words per minute, the speed with which you actually read the words when you get down to the reading. And this is the only part of the course where we really deal with so-called speed reading techniques, and we don't really even get that far into the speed reading per se. We just want to increase our ability to read quickly and consistently. And then finally, in phase three, I will teach you some techniques about how to remember exactly what you need from your reading. And you'll see that this is a really great culmination of all of your learning because you'll take all of this reading and these strategies and you'll be able to walk away from the text with a really clear idea of what's in it and how to remember it. So let's get started. And the central text of, or a central example that we'll be coming back to, not only throughout this session, but throughout all remaining sessions, is a chapter from the book Capturing Sound. And this is by Mark Katz, and the chapter is called Capturing Jazz. And the book is called Capturing Sound, How Technology Has Changed Music. So we'll just be using this as an example throughout. I'll be reading you some portions of it in this session, and also we'll be talking about it in later sessions as well. Okay, how to understand without reading step one. Ask yourself, when can I stop reading? Okay, you should remember this from the first session. But specifically, let's get a strategy for how to determine when to stop reading. And I want to introduce a chart to you here, a way to think about your reading uh, and your reading goals. I call it the reading depth chart. So use the reading depth chart to determine your goal for understanding. Write down your understanding goal. That way, when you're in the middle of reading, you won't have to think about, oh, what was my reading goal again? You'll have it right there next to you so you can see it and you know how far to go. So what's the deal with this reading depth chart? Well, I find it helpful to think of the understanding goals in terms of a metaphor, and that's the metaphor of the levels of the ocean. Okay, the ocean has different levels or zones or depths. And if we're talking about the ocean, we can talk about the various zones. And the highest zone, the one closest to the surface, is called the sunlight zone because sunlight can get through. And then the zone or level just beneath that is called the twilight zone. And then you have the midnight zone which is the biggest zone, and then the abyss. Sounds kind of scary, doesn't it? Uh, the abyss is below that, and then the trenches. And while this one looks like the largest, technically there are only a few spots in on the planet where there are these really deep trenches that go very, very, very deep. 
and are the deepest spots on the planet. For instance, the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest spot on the planet. So if we think about the levels of reading that we talked about last session, they can correspond to these zones. So the sunlight zone would correspond to level one of your understanding goal, which is just what it's about, what this reading is about. The next level down is level two, in which you know the central claim. The third level is level three, where you have a working knowledge of three to five core examples. The next level would be the abyss. That's level four, working knowledge of most details. And then the trenches, uh, level five, all details memorized. And if you recall from the last session, that's the life or death, uh, very serious level of reading. And I like this chart because it dramatizes that, that process of reading depth and shows you that you really, should, uh, you really should hang out in certain zones and maybe not others, right? If you get down into the trenches, it's get, it gets more and more dangerous. And I think that's true of reading because uh, we don't always need to go for the trenches. Sometimes we can stay a little bit more shallow and, and it's okay. So let's talk about some principles that go along with this depth chart. Uh, in general, the depth of layers equals the depth of understanding goals. So this is just a handy way maybe to help you think about uh, how, to, how to approach your reading. But here's something that's very important. These levels are reached in order. So if you're, if you're going diving, you don't jump straight to the abyss. You have to descend through the sunlight zone, continue through the twilight zone, and into the successive zones. You can't just hop from the surface down into the midnight zone, for instance, or level three. So you have to reach these levels in order. And when you're reading, it should be the same way. You should start with the level one questions. What is it about? And then go to level two, level three, and so on questions. Here's another important principle. The deeper levels, if you have a deeper level of understanding goal, it assumes that you also have the shallower levels covered. So if your goal is a level three and a working knowledge of three to five core examples, you really it assumes that you know also the central claim and can articulate that as well as knowing what it's about and can articulate that as well. So here are some principles for using this reading depth chart and uh, we're gonna use this throughout as we kind of approach our examples here for the rest of the course. Now remember at, before we go on that you're gonna hang out in in college courses probably mostly around level three if it's a textbook for let's say a science course or if it's a textbook for a history course where you need to know a lot of dates and names and figures maybe level four is going to be where you hang out uh, but if you're doing research for a research paper at first you're going to want to gather a lot of sources and just do levels one and two and then get a feel for what's out there and then when you identify some central re reading passages, you can go to levels three and four and so on. And you can download a copy of this reading depth chart in the PDF that I've provided for you in the handout. You might just download it and then print it out and keep it by your desk to use as you read, or you can keep it on your desktop or in your file and open it up and look, look at it and refer to it as you do your own reading assignments. Okay, how to understand without reading, step number two. Ask yourself, how long should this take? You want to set your timer using chunks of at least 30 minutes of focused, uninterrupted blocks of time. Okay, and so for a passage, you want to set your timer, maybe it's 30 minutes, maybe it's a little bit less, and then, and then get it started. And you want to try to accomplish your task within the time allotted. For now, we'll consider about 30 minutes of focused, interrupted time to get to level three, okay? 
All right, so we've got our understanding goal, which is level three, and we've got our timer set. It's at 30 minutes, and we're going to start heading down the road. Okay, how to understand without reading step number three. Study the title of the passage for at least 30 seconds. Consider every word, asking yourself, what is it about? Now, oftentimes we're a poor judge. As humans, we're poor judges of the passage of time. So 30 seconds in your mind, you might, you might think, oh, that's pretty short. But if you actually try to count out 30 seconds, it ends up being quite a long time. And I, I put 30 seconds here because I really want you to consider beyond what you would typically do, every word of a title, and ask yourself questions about it. Okay, you want to interrogate the title of the passage that you're reading, because the title is the first key to unlocking the path through the text. And I really want you to, to get this, so let's do a couple examples, okay? Let's look at a couple examples. Here's the first one. The Declaration of Independence. Think about that for a moment. The Declaration of Independence. Okay, consider every word. Well, declaration. Okay, a declaration is a, a statement. Notice it's not the summary of independence. That would be something different. It's not the hope of independence. It's not uh, something quite different like Let's imagine if it were titled The Refusal of Independence. That would be quite a different document. Or what if it was The Destruction of Independence? Okay, this would be quite a different document. So we're declaring something here. It's a statement. It, it includes finality. Okay? The de Declaration of Independence. Okay, independence. Notice, for instance, it's not dependence. It's not a declaration of dependence. It's not a... a declaration of anything else or uh, of complaint. It's not a declaration of protest. So we get an idea here that this is a statement that declares independence from something. And of course, you're probably familiar with this document, the Declaration of Independence uh, of the United States of America. Okay, now you may be tempted to stop there, right? We got declaration, we got independence, but don't stop there. We have two more words, and let's consider every word. First, let's look at that little word of in the middle. That of is important. For instance, imagine other prepositions that could be used. The declaration with independence, the declaration against independence, or the declaration for independence. Each of these would be a slightly different document. And what about that definite article, the? The, notice it's not a declaration of independence. It's the declaration of independence. Okay, that is called the definite article, the, instead of the indefinite article, which would be a. It leads and increases the sense of finality. It leads to a sense of unity. In other words, there are not other declarations going on here. You shouldn't be also reading four other declarations of independence that all are kind of in conversation with one another. This is the one. This is the declaration of independence. Okay, now we took longer than 30 seconds to discuss this, but you can go through this all in your mind much more quickly and get a, a real clear feeling for what this document might be about. Okay, let's take another title. We'll move a little bit more quickly here. Here's one, Crime and Punishment. Okay, this is a novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky, Russian 19th century novelist. What do you think is going to be in this book? Well, I imagine there's probably going to be a crime that happens. And I also imagine there's going to be some sort of punishment Right? There's going to be some crime, and there's going to be some punishment, and I guess that's the fun of the novel, is figuring out what's the crime and what is the punishment. But notice that little word, and. It's not crime or punishment. It's crime and punishment. 
we can expect that whoever the central character of who commits the crime is in some way going to be punished. Okay, let's take another example. We got we have two more here. Here's one from a a book about music in the 20th century. Classical music in the 20th century. And here's the title. I love this title. Beethoven was wrong. Bop, rock, and the minimalists. Okay. Well, we have this opening statement, Beethoven was wrong. But let's look at what comes after the colon first. Because what you'll find in academic titles or in history titles is what comes before the colon is something more poetic or inferential, and then what comes after it is more categorical. So the subject of this chapter we expect would be bop, and if you know about jazz, you might think that that refers to bebop, okay, so we'll have to see. And then rock, which I assume refers to rock and roll, or the music genre of rock, which came after rock and roll and the minimalists, which I assume at this point, since we haven't read this yet, we can assume that that maybe is a group of people who call themselves the minimalists, and we'll, we can ask ourselves, okay, well I guess it's probably about bop, rock, and the minimalists. But at this point we should be intrigued by the first part of that title. Beethoven was wrong. Okay, well what did Beethoven think, and why was he wrong? And who thought he was wrong? And was he really wrong? Okay, well, I think he was wrong. What's the author trying to pull here? And uh, if we have, if we just take a little bit of time here to consider what might be coming, we can really increase our pleasure in reading because we now have questions that we can answer uh, from the text. We, we aren't just approaching it with a blank slate. Okay, one last title here. Capturing Jazz. This is the, the title of the central text that we'll be coming back to again in this session. Capturing Jazz. Well, I assume it's about jazz, the topic of jazz, but there's this word capturing. So, since I told you earlier that the title of the book is called Capturing Sound, How Technology Changed Music, uh, maybe this is about some way in which technology has captured jazz, or jazz has been captured by technology, so we'll have to figure out what that means. But hopefully you can see here with these examples that we can extract a lot of information out of the titles, really try to interrogate the title. Imagine you're sitting in a room with it, and you want to wring all of the information that you can out of it, really to prompt questions from the text and get an idea of what you think it might be about. Okay, how to understand without reading step number four. Read the subject headings to get an outline of the passage. Refine your question, what is it about? Now, not all passages are going to have subject headings, and if your passage does not have subject headings, then you can skip this you can skip this step or you can look for larger spaces in the text which set off sections and then you can provide your own subject headings at some point uh, using the next step that I will tell you but let's say that our text has headings and what we want to do here is look at the headings and see if we can get any more information of, and refine our question what is it about so let's look again at this capturing jazz reading and I'm gonna give you the headings and we're gonna ask questions of these headings and see if we can get any closer or more refined question of what is this about so here are the headings the first heading is portability and invisibility the second heading is temporality the third heading is repeatability and the fourth is receptivity. These are the only four subject headings in this chapter, and the chapter opens with a section that has no subject heading and ends with a section that has no subject heading. So, okay, what could this mean? Well, let's just start asking questions about these terms. 
Portability refers to something that can be that is portable, that can be moved from one place to another, is not stationary or fixed like a building, but maybe is something portable like technology. And invisibility refers to, well, the quality of being invisible, and I wonder what that is referring to. It could refer to the invisibility of the music, or the invisibility of the technology, or the invisibility of the players. And we'll have to see what that refers to when we get to our next step. Temporality. Well, I expect this section to deal in one way or another with time. Tempora and time or temporal refers to time, and music is a timely art. And so perhaps in some way this section is going to be talking about the temporality of jazz. Repeatability. Okay, well... Uh, how repeatable is jazz, and how did maybe technology affect the repeatability of jazz? And then finally, receptivity. How was jazz received, perhaps? That could be what this section is about. Uh, how, how was it received by various groups, such as players, or audience, or maybe maybe technologists or businesses will have to see what that means. So as you can see, we haven't quite answered all of our questions yet uh, because these section headings give us get us in the ballpark but don't really tell us exactly what each section is about. So we're going to need to go further. So let's go to step number five. Read the first and last paragraphs to get the summary then read the topic sentence of each paragraph in between and ask yourself, is it about what I thought? So we've just been asking, what is it about? And we've read the title, and we've considered the headings, and now we're going to ask the question, is it about what I thought? We're going to try to answer some of these questions that we had before. Now you may have heard this strategy of reading the first and last paragraphs of a chapter to get the summary and conclusion, and so we're not going to do that right now, but this is an excellent way to get a sense of the overall argument of the chapter because a good author is going to give you the summary and the conclusion in, in those first and last paragraphs. But here's a trick. This one's less well known, but it is so helpful to understanding the text. If you read the topic sentence of each paragraph throughout the text, you're only reading, let's say, about 20% of the text, give or take. But if your author is being very helpful, he or she will give you a, a kind of shortcut, or you might say a smart cut through the text to get all of the central concepts in sequence. And then the re if they put the central concept in the topic sentence and then the details in the paragraph, and you just want to get a level two, let's say, uh, which is what is the central claim, then reading the topic sentence is a lightning fast way to get a sense of the entire chapter in greater detail. So what I've done for you here is I've given you the topic sentences of the first two sections of capturing jazz. On this slide it's the first section and then the next slide will have the topic sentence for the second section. So let's just go through this and see what we can get out of it. Okay, the first section has no heading, so the first sentence of the first paragraph is, the original Dixieland jazz band was in the right place at the right time. Paragraph 2, it has often been said that this disc was hardly representative of contemporary jazz playing. Paragraph 3, yet whether the name on the label was the original Dixieland Jazz Band or Fletcher Henderson, these early recordings were atypical for a reason having nothing to do with race or sound. Okay, well, this is a little bit cryptic here, but in fact, we can get quite a bit out of this. For instance, just understanding that this chapter is going to deal with certain central players such as the original Dixieland Jazz Band, and if you look in paragraph 3, Fletcher Henderson, obviously something's going on here between the original Dixieland Jazz Band and Fletcher Henderson, and there's a disc involved. There's a record involved. In paragraph 2, 
we can see that there was a disc that was not representative of contemporary jazz playing. But really in paragraph three, if we are really kind of sleuthy here, we can find the thesis of this chapter. And the clue here is in the second half of the first sentence of paragraph three. So looking at paragraph three after the comma, these early recordings were atypical. So these early recordings were atypical for a reason having nothing to do with race or sound. So your brain can immediately think, okay, early recordings were atypical, but why were they atypical? I know it's not having any, or at least the author is saying, it didn't have to do with race, that is whiteness, blackness, or otherwise, or sound, referring to the sound quality. But maybe some other, some other qualities had to do with these early recordings being atypical, okay? So you can see, just looking at the first three, we can get a whole lot out of what's going on. We already know the central players of the chapter. We already know that these records were atypical of contemporary jazz playing. And we know that they don't have to do with race or sound. Now let's find out what they do have to do with. So let's go on to the next section. Remember, we're just reading the topic sentences of this chapter. This is the second section. This heading is portability and invisibility, and if you're thinking, wait a second, portability and invisibility are two qualities, and he, we've just realized that this chapter is going to tell us about qualities that made jazz recordings atypical. Aha! Now we're getting somewhere. If we wanted to say the reasons or the qualities that made jazz recordings atypical, perhaps it has to do with portability invisibility, repeat, repeatability, and all these other nouns or qualities that are the, sec the section headings to this chapter. This is getting exciting. Are you excited? I'm excited. Okay, let's figure it out. This is like a mystery. Let's figure it out. Okay, paragraph four. Portability and invisibility. Paragraph four, topic sentence. In the early decades of the 20th century, jazz musicians fanned out from New Orleans, carrying the music throughout the land. Okay, paragraph five. Phonographic dissemination made jazz accessible not only to the listening public, but to aspiring jazz performer composers as well. Paragraph six. It was not only the musicians living far from the big cities that benefited from the phonograph. Paragraph seven. By removing jazz from the nightclub atmosphere, Freeman and all those learning from their phonographs were also removing jazz from its typical visual surroundings. Paragraph 8, the portable sound recording had an enormous impact on the development of jazz. So let's imagine we were reading this, uh, let's just pause here for a minute and imagine we were reading this the old way. And how long would it take us to get to the end of this first section? Maybe it would take us 30 minutes. But if we get to paragraph 8 and see this topic sentence, the portable sound recording had an enormous impact on the development of jazz. Now we've finally clearly gotten an answer to what this chapter is about. In summary, the portable sound recording had an enormous impact on the development of jazz. And if someone were to ask you what this chapter was about, that would be a sufficient answer for level 1, and then almost down to level two, okay? But to get really get a handle on level two, we'll need to keep going and dig in here. But just notice here that by skipping the, by doing pre-reading first and doing these strategies of understanding without reading, we've gotten to the good stuff much more quickly than if we had read in the old way. Okay, so just a couple things you might get out of these topic sentences. We can see that there's a mobility of jazz musicians in paragraph four, sentence one. We have musicians leaving New Orleans and going throughout the land. Paragraph five talks about phonographic dissemination, that is the dissemination of recordings. This made jazz accessible not just to the listening public, but to aspiring performer composers as well. 
And I want you to look at paragraph 6. Remember, these are just the first sentences from each paragraph. But this is another little secret. Authors often summarize the previous paragraph in the topic sentence of the following paragraph. So if you look at paragraph 6, it says, It was not only the musicians living far from the big cities that benefited from the phonograph. What that tells me is that in the preceding paragraph, paragraph 5, what he's really talking about is that photographic dissemination really affected or benefited those musicians living far from big cities. And you can fill in the blanks here and say, maybe they didn't have as many live performances in those rural communities, but when they could buy a phonograph, they could get access to those, those performances, even though they didn't live in New York or Chicago or New Orleans. Now, paragraph seven, so that, before we go on there, link that back up to the heading. Which half of that heading have we been talking about so far in uh, paragraphs four, five, and six? Well, portability, right? We're talking about jazz musicians moving across the land, we're talking about phonographs moving across the land, and we're talking about musicians getting access to this music. So the portability refers to both musicians and records. Now paragraph seven answers the invisibility aspect. The topic sentence says, by removing jazz from the nightclub atmosphere, the phonographs were also removing jazz from its typical visual surroundings. So what the phonograph did, we assume, was remove jazz from its typical nightclub atmosphere and took away the visual surroundings, thus making jazz more invisible, or some aspects of jazz, and perhaps there were uh, aspects of jazz that, that were um, maybe controversial in some way, and by removing them, it affected the way that jazz was received. Okay, so hopefully you can see, we're not gonna go on here for the rest of the chapter, but hopefully you can see that if we did, we could get a pretty good handle with some pretty good details about what this chapter is about. Okay, let's summarize the five steps that we've gone through because we've come to the end of this process of understanding without reading. Here's step number one. Ask yourself, where, excuse me, when can I stop reading? Use the reading depth chart to do this. Step number two, Decide how long this should take, and set your timer and start it. Then, ask yourself, what is it about? Consider the title for at least 30 seconds, and interrogate the title. Consider every word. Step number four, refine this question, what is it about, by looking at the headings, if there are headings. The headings will give you an outline of the chapter if they're done well. Now step five, ask yourself, is it about what I thought? And begin to answer this question by just reading the topic. Well, first read the first paragraph and the final paragraph, and then the topic sentences of every paragraph in between. Okay, so now that we've gone through that exercise with this chapter, capturing jazz. Let's look back at our reading depth chart and ask, can I stop reading? Remember that question? Can I stop reading? Well, I feel like we certainly know what it's about. It's about how sound recording affected jazz. And the central claim, level two, is that Mark Katz believes that sound recording affected jazz incredibly along some specific lines, the qualities of invisibility, portability, repeatability, and all of those elements that were in the section headings. We can even dig down a little bit more and give some specifics just from reading the first lines of the paragraphs. But 
while I think we're breaking through to the midnight zone or level three, remember level three was our goal, I think we need to learn a little bit more about the core examples and really get into actually reading this text. And we're going to do that in the next session. Okay, let's do an exercise here. I want you to choose a passage. I want you to find a book and choose a passage. And with that passage, go through all five steps that I've just presented to you. I want you to aim for understanding level two only at this stage. That is, what is it about and what is the central claim? And if you can get, if you can break through to level three, uh, please do. If you can break through to that midnight zone, do that. Put 10 minutes on your timer to give yourself a little bit of extra time to do this your first time through and just see how far you can get. Really time yourself and give yourself an uninterrupted block of time. And really, if you want to get the most out of this exercise, don't do this just once. What you want to do is you want to do this with uh, a number of different passages so that you can get a feel for it. And wouldn't it be interesting if you took 30 minutes and got through three, three passages or books or chapters that you've always been wanting to get around to reading and just said, you know what, I'm just going to get to level two in all three of these and see which one is interesting and then go from there. So do this exercise now or at your earliest convenience and then come back for session three. Thanks, and I'll see you soon.